welcome to tonight. Um, the original plan was to have a bit of a, a talk, sort of a presentation thing, and then go and do a live demonstration on the roof. Unfortunately, it is both drizzling, cloudy, and with 40 mile an hour winds. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be doing that tonight. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start with a presentation about astrophotography. I'm going to talk to you a bit about what it is, why we do it, um, and go over a whole load of theory that you might need to know if you want to sort of think about doing it or understand at least how it's sort of done. Um, then we will have a Q&A session at the end if you've got any questions. And then I've got my telescope here set up, uh, all connected to the laptop. I can show you how that works, how it sort of, um, how I can then control it with the laptop, set up a sequence, take images and stuff like that as well. Um, and then on the next available night, uh, where we have clear skies and I'm free, then we will do a shortlist observation, but it will be an actual quickly shortlist observation. So if anyone's free that night, you can come along. We'll I'll talk you through setting up the telescope, taking images, and then hopefully you'll be able to see the end results of what we can achieve with this sort of equipment. Um, so I imagine most of you will know who I am by now. If you don't, I'm Oscar. I'm a a physics student. I've done astrophotography for about the last four years of my life. Um, has anyone here done astrophotography before from any any sort of uh, capacity? Anyone taken a phone, picture with their phone from a telescope? Yeah, most people. So we'll, we'll be sort of talking about the next level up from that, um, how you can do it starting from just a DSLR camera all the way up to a sophisticated telescope uh, rig. Um, if I skip over something and don't clarify high enough and you don't know what I'm on about, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, and we'll be doing Q&A at the end. So uh, if you have any sort of general questions, you can leave them for then. So get right into it. So what is astrophotography? Well, an astrophotographer is a person who spends way too much money on a piece of glass inside a tube, gets easily depressed by numbers, and then spends even more money. I think that's fairly accurate. It is a bit of a money pit. It's also a bit of a time pit and a... Um, endless well of frustration. Um, but in short, astrophotography is taking pictures of stuff in space. Um, and that can be anything from huge landscapes with big swathes of the Milky Way to stars to planets. Um, anything like that is astrophotography. Um, it has its origins in um, sort of science, in sort of professional observatories taking pictures um, of, of the deep sky, particularly. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, so the teams um, in America working with Hubble, uh, pioneered a lot of techniques that I'll be talking about tonight, um, such as stacking, stretching, etc., um, which are used by amateur and professional astro astrophotographers all over the world. Um, so it's quite a recent, um, recent thing, only in the last sort of 50 years. Um, and our goal is to sort of take a pretty picture, really. Um, some people do astrophotography for science, um, there's people who track comets and upload their sort of positions to archives. Some people who try and find new nebulae that nobody's ever discovered before. But most people are not photographing anything new, but doing their best to photograph it in a, as, as good a way as they possibly can and get a really nice picture of something that very few people get to see. Um, now, what can you see? So if you're looking through uh, a telescope with your eyes, um, for those of you who have been to Astrosoc and looked through telescopes, this is probably what you'd see. Um, nebulae, if you're really lucky, like the Orion Nebula, you might be able to see a bit of colour. Galaxies look like a fuzzy blob. Comets look like a slightly different fuzzy blob. <laughs> um, and this is because your eye is very small. You can't see a lot of light. Um, you can't take a long exposure or whatever like, like that. Uh, you can't do any processing. So what you see is what you get. However, with astrophotography, we can get completely different images. Um, these are all the same objects, by the way. Um, so there is a huge difference with what we can achieve by taking photographs and what you can achieve by just looking with your eye. Um, and that is because everything in space is very, very faint. Um, so we need a long exposure with a camera and we need a telescope to gather light to be able to really uh, see as much as we can. So astrophotography is a sort of umbrella term. Uh, it's split into probably four different disciplines. Um, so you've got planetary, um, which is not just planets, it's basically anything inside the solar system that's not the sun. So that's things like uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, etc., but also the moon and comets and asteroids and stuff like that as well. Um, all of these disciplines have very different requirements in processing uh, equipment and technique uh, and everything as well. 
So planetary astrophotography, you need a really big telescope, you need a camera that can take uh, lots and lots of exposures very quickly. Um, whereas solar imaging, for example, the sun's very bright, so actually having a big telescope isn't that important. Um, uh, but you do, however, need a, a very expensive solar filter so that your entire equipment doesn't get melted. Um, you then have landscape, which is sort of big swathes of the Milky Way, um, or, or sort of constellations, night sky as a whole, often the landscape in front of it as well. Um, so you get a really nice picture of you know, some mountains or something um, with the big Milky Way in the background. Solar is the sun. Um, pull hard. There you go. <laughs> solar is obviously the sun. Um, you do need a solar blocking filter for that. Um, but then you can get great images like this of granulations, solar flares, stuff like that. Um, and then deep sky is what I do. Um, it's basically anything that's outside the solar system. Um, and when we talk about deep sky, we're normally talking about single objects or regions. So you'll be thinking about shooting a galaxy or a group of galaxies or a nebula or a star cluster. Um, it's very much sort of individual objects rather than huge wide field views um, over sort of big over the, the like constellation level. Um, most people only do one out of these four. Some people will do two. Some people who are very uh, rich and have lots of time do more than two. Um, but because they all require very different equipment and none of that equipment is cheap, um, most people just do one. And I do deep sky. So that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about tonight. I think it's the most interesting. You get the biggest variety of objects. And I think they look the prettiest. So yeah, so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight is deep sky astrophotography. Bear in mind there are other ones that exist and you won't hear about them from me. So I want to begin a bit with my progression for astrophotography. Um, talk about pull. There you go. <laughs> yeah, we'll just keep it open. I mean nobody's around this time of day, are they? Can you hear me right, by the way, or should I put the microphone on? Okay, all good. So, my freshman for astrophotography, uh, obviously everyone's going to start somewhere, and I started with this. So it's a Select Straw Nexstar 6SE Schmitz Kassegrin go-to telescope. It's actually a very nice telescope, and I was luckily, luckily enough to get this um, for uh, my 18th birthday. I had no idea what to do with it. Um, spent about six months messing around trying to get it to work. Finally got it to work and got some really crappy photos. Um, so the thing about this telescope is it's not an astrophotography telescope. Um, as I'll go on to a bit later, uh, telescopes designed for looking through and telescopes designed for taking photos through are very different pieces of equipment. This is designed for looking through and it's really fantastic for that. I didn't know this. Um, so I sort of started by just sticking my phone up to the telescope, to the eyepiece, take some photos through and look, there's a couple of stars, there's a moon, um, and there's the first nebula I shot, which is the Swan Nebula. Um, you can kind of see the shape if you squint and tilt your head. Um, then I kind of got a bit more into astrophotography. Um, I modified the telescope a bit. I put a dew shield on it. Um, I put dew heaters on it as well, so I didn't have to go out with a hairdryer every 20 minutes and uh, blow the dew off it. Uh, put a proper camera on it, which I nicked from my mum. And then I got these sorts of photos. But at this point, I'm still very limited. Um, the telescope, you can only take uh, shorter exposures, about 20 seconds, which meant I... Um, my images were very noisy, they had a very tight field of view, um, so you could only get like really small things in it. Um, and it wasn't really great for astrophotography. So at this point I sold it, and I bought this one, which is what you can see here. Um, this is a refracting telescope, so it uses lenses. Um, it's specifically designed for astrophotography. Um, it's a proper tracking mount, which is able to track things really precisely, and it means I can now take much longer exposures. And through this, I was able to get much better images. So you can see the North American Nebula up there, and then the Andromeda Galaxy as well, the second image. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I did the final modification, which is I swapped out the camera from a DSLR to a um, dedicated Astro camera. So rather than being a color camera, it's a monochrome camera. And I'll talk a bit about why that's useful later on. It has filters in it, so you can filter for different wavelengths of light. Um, and that means you can get much more fantastic images of nebulae like those, and it also makes it much easier to shoot in light polluted areas like the city. And this is where I am now. That's sort of my most recent edited image. That is the Lion Nebula, a uh, total of 32 hours of exposure over five different nights over summer. 
Um, and that's sort of, yeah, basically the level I'm at over the, over the last sort of four years. So just to give you a quick overview of equipment, there's sort of four tiers of equipment um, I want to sort of introduce you to. And then at the end of the talk, when you know a bit more, I'll tell you a little bit more about those and sort of uh, if you were interested in doing astrophotography, how much you might be ex uh, expected to spend on each. So the most basic setup is Untracked. It's a DSLR camera with a lens on a tripod. Um, this is the most accessible type of uh, setup. Most people will have access to a camera like this through a family member, or if you don't, you can get them on eBay or Facebook Marketplace for not huge sums of money. Um, and you can just set that up anywhere in your garden, point it, point it up at the sky, take some photos. Um, the next upgrade from that is you stick your camera on a tracking mount. So as the Earth rotates, the stars move across the sky. So if you want to be able to take a longer exposure, you need to be able to follow whatever you're looking at um, so that it doesn't sort of get all blurred while you're trying to do it. So you can have a very basic tracking mount like that. You can have maybe a slightly better lens. Um, but here you're looking at very wide field uh, views of the sky, sort of on the size of constellations, uh, maybe sort of larger objects like big galaxies and stuff like that. But this is going to be a very wide field of view, um, hence the wide field name. Um, and then progressing from that, you've got the basic, what I'd call complete setup. So here you have a proper telescope. Um, and that needs to be supported by a beefier mount that's able to take the weight and still track well. Um, and then you can have a guide scope on top of it, and I'll talk a bit about guiding later, uh, which means that you're able to track much better, take longer exposures, um, and get better images. And then you can take that to the max. You can get a really sort of premium telescope, premium mount, um, things that will focus automatically for you, things that will rotate your camera automatically for you, stuff like that. And spend you know well over ten thousand pounds on a setup like the advanced one there. So all the way at the bottom end, you're looking at sort of two hundred pounds. All the way up at the top end, you're looking at ten thousand pounds plus. Um, this is sort of somewhere in between uh, the two on the right. So I'm going to talk a bit more about the theory now um, of how we do astrophotography and some of the things we need to know. Um, and there's sort of four axioms or four key things that I think are important. And these are optics, so what are you using to uh, focus, your, gather your light, focus it, and um, be able to see the object that you're trying to image. There's your tracking, which is how do you track that object through the night sky and make sure that tracking is stable so that you can take long exposures. There's image capture, so how do you capture it, what sort of camera do you need, um, and then processing that image at the end as well. So how do you go from a bunch of images of the night sky to a final picture? Um, and I'll sort of cover each one of these um, and like I said, if you've got any questions, feel free to raise your hand at any point and I'll try and answer them. So first of all, start with telescopes, telescope properties. There's two key numbers that define a telescope. Uh, one is the focal length, one is the aperture. Uh, the focal length is a measure of how strongly the system bends light. Basically, the longer the focal length, um, the more magnified your image will appear. And then aperture is the diameter of the primary lens or mirror. Um, it's how much light you can gather. Basically, it's the, it's the sort of rate, uh, diameter of that circle that you've got across. So you see that telescope there is really quite small. Um, the aperture on that is only eight centimeters. Um, compare that to our white Dobsonian that we have up on the roof. That's uh, 12 inches, which I think is 300 centimeters. Sorry, 300 millimeters, 30 centimeters. Um, so you get very, very different sizes of telescope. And then the relationship between the two is F ratio, which is just the focal length divided by the diameter of the mirror. Um, and that tells you how bright your image is going to be. Um, if you have two telescopes, one has an f-ratio of 8 and one has an f-ratio of 6, um, the f-ratio of 6 will be able to get much brighter image in the same exposure time as a telescope with f-ratio 8. So that really sort of defines um, how long our exposure time is going to be to get a good image of something. Um, so, yeah, so there's different types of telescope. I know. Long slide. Um, so something we've got to be uh, mindful of with telescopes is optical aberrations. So telescopes are perfect, um, and that's going to show up in our images quite um, sort of obviously with the stars. So stars are pinpoints of light. Any aberrations uh, are very sort of affect them very clearly, like you can see here. Um, and we need to be mindful of those and what sort of uh, effect they're going to have on the image. So if you have no aberration like that, you'd expect your stars to be a pinpoint. Um, we can have chromatic aberration, so where you have lenses, um, the light doesn't bend evenly, 
um, and you get the sort of smearing of the light where you have blue at one end and red at, red at, at another. Um, if you have a spherical mirror or lens, you get spherical aberration where the light isn't focused at the same point. And then you can also have karyma, astigmatism, and combinations of the above. Now, we can correct these to a certain extent with um, things like chroma correctors and field flatteners, um, which are which just sort of go in the telescope between the telescope and whatever you're looking through, either an eyepiece or a camera. Um, but we also need to be mindful of what telescopes are going to have these aberrations and how bad they're going to be. Um, this is one of the reasons why astrophotography is not cheap, um, because if you're going to buy a telescope for it, you can't just buy any telescope, because a you know, 150 pound telescope from Amazon is going to have horrible aberrations um, compared to a 800 pound telescope that's been specifically made for the job. So it's one of the things you've got to be really mindful of, um, because these will like seriously mess up an image if you've got uh, sort of poorly made optics. So in astrophotography, there's four main types of telescope design. One of them is a lens, but we'll ignore that. Uh, four types of telescope design that we sort of consider. Um, these are refractors, reflectors, uh, Schmidt categories, and camera lenses. So refractors are uh, refracting telescopes, like the name says. The they have lenses which bend the light to focus it. That telescope there is a refracting telescope. Uh, reflectors um, use mirrors rather than lenses, so the light comes in, bounces off the back, comes out the side, and you get your image. Schmidt's categories use a combination of both lenses and mirrors, um, and they sort of have an almost folded design, uh, which makes them nice and compact. And camera lenses have a series of lenses within them, uh, which allow you to focus at um, different focal lengths, something that um, telescopes don't uh, have. So each of these has pros and cons. Um, so for choosing a telescope, refractors, uh, their pros are they're very easy to use. Uh, you don't really have to do anything with them. You can just pick one up and use it. Um, collimation is a thing where if you have a telescope with mirrors, the mirrors can come unaligned and you have to realign them to get a good image. Refractors have lenses. It's all a very sort of compact, stable system, so you never have to collimate it. Um, this is why I have one, because it's easy. You just pick it up and you're good to go. Um, they're also nice and portable. They're, they tend to be very small, partly because they are very expensive once they get large. Um, so because they have lenses, you need to correct for chromatic, chromatic aberration, which means you never have, need to have a number of lenses within them, um, which all adds up uh, to quite a lot of money and quite a lot of weight. So they are probably, uh, for the aperture, they're the most expensive telescope. If you have... Um, sort of an eight inch telescope which is a pretty reasonable size for a newtonian um, but completely unheard of for a refractor for a newtonian you'd be able to buy a really good one for maybe 500 pounds for a refractor you're looking at five thousand pounds plus for the same size um, just because the lenses are so much more expensive to manufacture than mirrors um, but they are very portable they're very easy to use um, reflectors on the other hand are sort of the polar opposite they are by far the cheapest design um, especially for large apertures. Um, however, they are much less of a solid system. They require frequent collimation, so you've always got to be aligning, realigning those mirrors. Um, they're bigger and heavier, so they require quite sturdy mounts, um, and they have their optical aberrations are a bit more difficult to solve than uh, a refractor. They've got coma, they've got astigmatism, um, so you need to be sort of mindful to get a good model and you have, have to have a coma corrector on that as well usually. So it's just extra kit that you want to worry about. And then the other two, um, Schmidt categories are more expensive than Newtonians, not quite as expensive as refractors, but they have the advantage of being really compact. So once you get up above a size, size of sort of 10 inches or more, um, then a Newtonian will get really big, a refractor will be huge. Um, whereas Schmidt Grass Cascarin is still quite nice and compact. Um, however, yeah, they're more expensive, they require collimation, um, and it has aberrations as well, but not quite as badly as the Newtonian. And then camera lenses. Uh, a lot of astrophotographers wouldn't talk about camera lenses at all because they're not telescopes, so why would you bother with it? Um, but they are relatively cheap and relatively available. Um, they're great for wide field shots. Telescopes tend to be very um, go from sort of extremely narrow field of view to a quite narrow field of view. Um, so if you want anything on the constellation size or bigger, camera lenses are the way to go. Um, however, many lenses aren't well corrected, 
um, and will give you very bad aberrations and images because they're designed for daytime use rather than nighttime use. Um, so you need to do thorough research to make sure that if you're buying a lens, it's actually going to be a good one for night sky photography. Um, something else worth considering in telescope designs is field of view. So I mentioned that briefly a moment ago. So there's an image there that is the heart and soul nebula. So the heart nebula is one in the top right, the soul nebula is one in the bottom left. Um, so if you're going to take a, field, uh, a picture like that, that's a really wide field of view. So to give you an idea, that's in the night sky, that's probably four full moons across. And if you wanted to do that, you'd want to use either a camera lens or a very small refractor in order to get such a wide field of view. However, um, within the heart nebula, right in the, in the center, there's this structure that I cannot remember the name of. Um, and that's, got, that's a very uh, small object. Um, so you want something with a very tight field of view. So if you're starting astrophotography and you want to buy a telescope, um, something to, be, uh, to consider is what sort of objects you want to image. If you want to be sort of doing small galaxies, small planetary nebulae, really sort of like tiny details within uh, sort of bigger structures, then you want something much bigger, like a schmitz cassegrain If you want to be doing wide field views with huge swathes of nebula in them, then you want something really small, like a uh, telephoto lens or a um, refracting telescope. So field of view is a, is a factor. So we talked a bit about optics. Um, then you need something to mount the optics on. Um, and this needs to be able to be a sturdy platform um, that's not going to shake or vibrate or cause anything to fall over. And it needs to be able to track objects in the night sky so you can take long exposures. Now, there's two types of mounts. There's alt azimuth and there's equatorial mounts. For deep sky photography, we have to use equatorial mounts. Um, and the reason for that is the reference point of the different mounts. So alt azimuth are the simplest mounts to sort of picture. Um, the reference point is you, the user. The mount has two dimensions it can move. It can move up and down, and it can move left and right. And that's really intuitive if you're doing manual, manual uh, astronomy and you're just trying to look through an eyepiece. So you can just move the telescope up and down. Um, but the problem with that is it, the movement of the telescope does not precisely follow the movement of the stars. Um, if you have an object that you're looking at and your telescope is pointing at it and it's going to be tracking it, it's going to be moving in both, both directions. And that causes something called field rotation. So anything that you've got in the center is going to stay nice and uh, stationary anything you've got around the edge is going to rotate. So if you were doing a one minute exposure, you notice your stars at the very edge will be slightly smeared. If you're doing five minutes, there'll be lines and you'll have so much less detail in your image. So um, as much amounts really limit the amount of um, exposure time that you can get on your images and therefore it limits the detail that you'll be able to get. Equatorial amounts, however, um, fix this problem by being essentially at an angle. So they still move up and down, left and right, in those um, sort of dimensions, but the whole thing is, is at an angle uh, equal to the latitude. So you see this telescope is at quite a high angle and that's about 54 degrees. Um, and that's because we are at about 54 degrees. And if the telescope's aligned properly, that means if you look for it, it will be pointed exactly at the pole star, um, which is pretty neat. Um, so that's how you can then sort of set that up and then once it moves to an object, it can track it without field rotation um, and take long exposure through the night sky. Um, there's two different types of equatorial mount. Doesn't particularly matter. Um, this type is gear or belt driven, um, which is just has a gear or belt that drives it. Um, the uh, <laughs> I don't know how to explain that any better. The other type is a harmonic mount. Um, so it's got a different type of gearing system called the strain wave system. They're a relatively new technology, um, but they have the advantage of being much, uh, much less heavy uh, and much more portable. So the mount head for that, not even the tripod, not even the counterweighters on it, is about 10 kilograms. Um, so, so it's really heavy. Um, I definitely feel it when I'm lugging it to campus. Um, so yeah, those are, those are two types of equitable mount. Doesn't really matter, they will track pretty well. Um, to be able to track well though, we need to be able to align the telescope. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, this is quite simple to do. We do it by aligning it to the pole star. Um, so you set the telescope up a bit like this. The front tripod leg there points to uh, points north, and you can do that with a compass or sort of just by reference if you know roughly where north is. Um, and then you need to adjust it so that it's pointed exactly where it's meant to be. 
so it's pointing exactly at the pole star. Um, there's two ways you can do it. The traditional way is with the polar scope. So there is a small telescope that runs through the length of the um, length of the mountain here. So you can take this cover off at the back, if you're free, and then this cover comes off at the front, and then <coughs> that allows you to see up to the sky. Um, and you can look through, find the pole star in that, and then adjust the telescope so that's properly aligned. That's really annoying to do, and I hate it with every fibre of my being. So um, we do it a well. I do it a different way, which is I use a computer. So you have a laptop, a bit like that one, um, that's connected to the telescope and the camera, and you do something called plate solving. So what it does is it takes a picture of the night sky. It takes the brightest stars of that image. So you see, like this one here, um, it's drawn a circle round those stars. Then it can measure the positions between them. Um, if you know the details of the telescope and you know the pixel distances between the stars, you know the angular distances on the night sky with a bit of maps. Once you know those angular distances, it can compare that to a database um, and work out exactly which stars you're looking at and therefore exactly which way you're pointing. So that's really, really useful. It's a fantastic piece of um, software to do it. Um, so you can do that. You can take that image, it works out where it's pointing, and then it can tell you exactly what correct route to make. Um, so then you can fiddle around with your mount, make those corrections, and it will be able to update you as you go of exactly how far off your error. Um, plane solving is really important in astrophotography um, because the mounts are never quite as accurate as you'd like them to be. Um, so when you point at an object, it's always useful to be able to plate solve, make sure you really point it at what you want to be pointed at, um, and then you can correct it if you need to. So once we're set up, we've managed to align a telescope, we've managed to point it at an object, um, we want to be able to track that object across the night sky and be able to take exposures. Um, the longer the exposure, within reason, the better the image we're going to get. So we want to be able to take long exposures with our telescope. However, um, a telescope that can take a five minute exposure completely on its own is a, uh, has to have a really um, solid, really well made mount, uh, which ends up costing a huge amount of money. So what we do instead is we kind of get around this by having guiding. And that guiding essentially allows us to make corrections to our telescope um, as it's tracking objects in the night sky. So what it does is you have a guide scope on top of the telescope. So you can see it's labelled there. I've got the, the black one there, if you can see it. And that's got a guide camera, which is a really sort of simple camera, similar to what you might have in a webcam. Um, and that takes uh, a load of short images uh, of what it can see through. It picks a star, and then it sees how that star moves as the telescope moves. So if your tracking is working properly, as the telescope tracks, that star will stay exactly where it is. But that almost never happens because you'll have manufacturing defects in the in the gears. It will slip sometimes. You might get a bit of wobble from wind. Um, so what it does is it sees how that um, object, how that little star moves in, in the pixels, and then it can send adjustments to the mount um, via sort of cable to then correct itself. So it sees the star move a little bit left. It tells the um, telescope move a little bit right to correct for that, um, and that's really useful. So for this telescope. That can take probably about two or three minute exposures without guiding. With guiding, it can take 10 minutes. So it really massively increases the, the, the length that you can expose with your camera. So once we nail down the tracking and the guiding, if we've got objects, we then need to be able to uh, photograph them. Um, astrophotography is particularly difficult because what we're trying to image is very, very faint. Um, so we actually have a very demanding set of requirements for cameras to be able to capture as much light as possible and give us the best images possible. So we need to, the cameras need to be optimised for getting a high signal to noise ratio as possible in low light. And for that we need a few different things. We need low thermal and shock noise. So thermal noise is the sort of random error, random noise that you get from the heat of the camera. Uh, shock noise is the preloaded noise that you get when you're taking an image. Uh, we want little to low amp flow, so amp flow is the current within the circuitry causing noise in your image. We want a high dynamic range, so that means we want to be able to store as much information as we can within each pixel of the camera. And we want the ability to take long exposures. So particularly older cameras, um, they're often limited in how long they can expose for. Um, so it might only be sort of 30 seconds as a very maximum. We want to be able to go well beyond that into the 5 minute, 10 minute range. So there's three and a half types of camera that we might want to consider for astrophotography. photography. Um, the most basic and available is the DSLR or mirrorless camera. Um, these are just what you know as cameras, but they're around. 
Um, they're great because lots of people have access to them. You can buy them secondhand for not loads of money. Um, however, they're not ideal. Um, part of the problem is uh, DSLR cameras have an infrared filter within them. Um, so this uh, means you can get sort of more balanced natural colors when you're taking photos of trees and birds and stuff. Um, but it means when you're doing astrophotography, um, it blocks out a lot of the uh, red hydrogen lights that you get from emission nebulae. And this is one of the most common um, sort of bands of light that you get in the night sky. Um, and I think it's about a quarter it, it reduces it down to. So you, lo you lose three quarters of your light due to this filter. Now you can modify your DSLR, so you can open it up, take this filter out, close it up again, and you can see what a difference this makes here with the image, the unmodified one on the right, um, you can barely see the nebula at all. Uh, the one on the left is nice and clear and bright and lots of detail. So that's really helpful when you're trying to do uh, astrophotography. However, we can, move a, we, we can move beyond that into something a bit better, and these are cooled, dedicated astrophotography cameras. So I'll get into why we call the cameras in a second. Um, but these are cameras, they've got no infrared filter, they've got specially sensitive chips, um, so they're, they're pretty much optimised for astrophotography. Um, there's two different types of technologies. There's CCDs and CMOS cameras. CCDs are very much the old type of camera. Um, they were what sort of the first digital camera chips were made out of. Uh, CMOS cameras are the new ones, they're the ones you find in your laptops, uh, mobile phones, or any sort of um, proper cameras that you buy today. Anyone over the age of 50 will tell you CCDs are better in every way. Um, and anyone who's a scientist will also tell you CCDs are better in every way. They are wrong. CMOS cameras have, up, have taken over CCDs in the last five or 10 years, um, mainly due to the advent of mobile phones. Um, so the fact that everyone's got a mobile phone, mobile phones need to have better and better cameras. So there's been a huge amount of best investment into CMOS camera technology. So CMOS cameras are currently the best ones for astrophotography. Um, they are much cheaper than CCDs while also giving you uh, lots of dynamic range, low noise and everything like that that you need. So the camera that I have on the back here, um, if you can see it, you might not be able to, um, is a cool CMOS camera, almost identical to the one in the picture, um, which is specially made for astrophotography. So when capturing our images, um, reducing noise is important. We've already talked about having a good camera with low noise, um, but we can improve that even more by cooling the camera. So I talked about thermal noise before, because the camera itself has a temperature, that temperature produces photons, those photons produce noise in the image. Um, and we can control that to a certain extent by cooling the camera. And you see here, uh, this picture, picture is, I think, the Seagull Nebula or something like that. Um, but you can see uncooled in the top is much, much grainier. You can see far less detail, it's much uh, fuzzier. But with cooling, um, you can see that noise is greatly reduced and you can see the image much better. Um, so that's why we cool the camera. Um, and this one cooled as well. Most cameras you can cool to about minus 45 below whatever amb ambient is. So if it's a warm summer's night and it's 20 degrees, you can cool the camera to about minus 25 if you really want to. So it can really cool sort of quite a, quite a long, Quite a, um, quite a wide temperature range and give you quite um, quite big results. Um, another big factor of noise is the sky itself. So there is a huge difference between shooting uh, an image in a polluted, light polluted city like Birmingham or London or anywhere like that compared to a dark sky site like uh, the middle of Wales or Scotland or anywhere where there's just nothing around. Um, I think on the extreme end, Compared to Birmingham and Scotland, um, one hour of exposure time in Scotland is equivalent to 20 hours of exposure time in Birmingham. So there is a huge, huge difference that the night sky can make. There is, I mean, it's been said that there is no substitute for going to a dark sky site to do your imaging. Um, you can see the, see the difference here. So on the image on the left, there's a, an image taken in a red zone, so that's sort of a suburb, city suburb area. Um, you can see there's much less detail. It's a bit fuzzier, and you can see a lot more of the noise. Compared to a dark sky site, you've always ex the exactly the same exposure time. You see much better, much better detail, much better colours, um, and much lower noise. So ideally, we want to image in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. Um, practically, we can't do that most of the time, um, so we have to make do with what we have. But it's an important thing to consider. If you can get out to a dark sky site image, you really should, unless you're lazy like me, and you just don't. <laughs> 
So I've mentioned exposure quite a bit. Um, basically, longer exposures allow us to get as much light as possible from faint objects, um, increases our signal to noise ratio, and means that we get better images with more detail. Exposure just means opening the camera shutter for longer, gathering more photons, and getting better image. Um, there is, however, diminishing returns from taking longer exposures. You know, hypothetically, you'd say, well, take a single 20 hour exposure. Well, there's not 20 hours in a night. Um, also, um, the, the signal to noise ratio goes as the square root of one over time. So the first one minute of exposure um, will be much more important than the next one minute and the next five minutes and the next 10 minutes. Um, so you get diminishing returns on taking a single exposure rather than lots of, lots of shorter ones, which we can then combine. Um, it's also worth considering that it's less of a problem if you lose a one minute exposure compared to a 10 minute exposure. Someone could easily um, walk, a, walk along with a head torch in front of your telescope or knock it slightly or um, you know, your AstroSoc fellow committee members can turn the hall light on in the cupboard for about 15 minutes, causing you to lose three frames. Rodri. <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> so it's important to sort of keep your exposure time down because of that, because I only had to be in five frames and Rodri didn't have to lose his head. <laughs> <laughs> So, talked about light pollution, noise, uh, something that can really help with that is filters. Filters allow you to increase signal to noise ratio by letting in less of the unwanted light, which essentially keep the signal while reducing your noise. These work especially well for emission nebulae. So the way emission, an emission nebula works, like uh, the horse head here, is you have a load of gas in space, you have some stars near that gas, the stars emit ultraviolet light, that light hits the gas and causes it to release light. Um, and the light that it is released is at a very specific wavelength, depending on the ionization of the, of the gas, what elements it has, um, and how much energy that ultraviolet light is. And we know these uh, frequencies of light very, very well. Um, so for example, hydrogen alpha causes that really uh, deep red. Um, oxygen three is a much bluer light. Um, and you've got all those other ones uh, listed up there. So what we can do is we can create a filter that looks like that in terms of band class, lets through a whole load of light um, at that specific wavelength and doesn't let anything through uh, the rest of the time. So for a colour camera, you quite often get duo band filters, so it's just hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. You can put that onto your camera and it will block out a whole load, whole load, whole load of light you don't want and give you a much brighter, much more, uh, much higher contrast image compared to without. Um, we can take that even further. Um, if you have a monochrome camera like mine, you can have individual filters for the individual um, atomic transitions. So, for example, uh, that sort of flat circular thing that's mounted in the telescope is a filter wheel. Inside that, there's a filter for just hydrogen alpha, one for just oxygen three, and one for just sulfur two. And you can shoot individual ones of those and combine them into a color image, getting a much higher signal to noise ratio than you would if you were shooting color and trying to get the entire thing in one. Um, Light pollution filters, they still are a thing. Um, they used to be much more effective than they are now because um, most street lighting is sodium lighting. And sodium does emit light across the entire spectrum. It emits it in a number of peaks. So what you can do is you can uh, have, a, have a filter which will then cut out those peaks while allowing in the light that we'll expect to see from space. Um, and that cuts out a lot of sodium lighting. However, since LEDs are used almost everywhere now and they emit across the entire spectrum, um, there's no use having a light pollution filter anymore. So I've talked a bit about monochrome. I have a monochrome camera on here, so that means it shoots black and white. And I'm going to try and tell you why shooting mono is better than shooting colour. Um, it's slightly complicated, so I should actually remember my notes. So on a colour camera, you have what's called a Bayer filter. Um, it's a row of, or it's a grid of coloured filters, which let in light, and they're, they're either green, uh, red or blue. And on a colour camera, you'll have um, twice the amount of green filters um, for every red and blue. And four of those combine together to make a single pixel. So one pixel will have two green filters, one red and one blue. Um, the light comes in, goes through the filters, or doesn't go through the filters, uh, hits the pixel, data is stored, and read off as your image. Color, uh, monochrome cameras, however, don't have that at all. Um, the light just comes in, hits the sensor, and is recorded. 
Um, the problem with a Bayer filter is it uh, blocks a whole load of the light that you're trying to get. So, for example, uh, any red light that you're going to get in that hydrogen emission nebula is going to be blocked if it sort of hits a green or a blue pixel. Likewise, any blue light will be blocked if it hits a green or a red pixel. So, what you get is actually um, if you're shooting for a particular something that has a particular sort of color weightedness, you're only going to get about a quarter of the light that you would expect to otherwise. Um, so if you've got a 10 megapixel sensor, what you essentially have is two and a half megapixels of color data overlaid over 10 megapixels of luminosity data. So your image is going to be much less vibrant, you're going to get less detail. So having a monochrome camera allows you to pick a filter, let all of your light through that filter, switch to a different filter, let all of your light through the filter, and that gives you about a 50% to 30% increase in sensitivity. What you're left with at the end is a load of black and white images. However, you can create that uh, Bayer filter in post. So for example, as a very basic one, you can have a filter that lets in a load of red light, put that in front of your camera, all the pixels read of red light, do the same with green and blue. So you get three monochrome images, one's red, one's green, one's blue. You can combine them together and that, that gives you a color image. So you can see there, um, for that nebula, you've got a single filter on the right, which gives you a black and white image. You combine them together and you get one color. And that gives you much more um, contrast, it allows you to gather much more data without changing what telescope you're at, how long the exposure is, or anything like that. Um, monochrome cameras are slightly more expensive because they're not very well used. You essentially have to take a color camera and dismantle it um, to take the, take the chip out, um, take the Bayer filter out, and then put it into a, into a different camera housing. Um, so they're very much sort of the, the upper end of astrophotography equipment, uh, but they're very useful. Almost every professional observatory uses them, so they're, they're really good. Bits of so we talked a bit about image capture, talked a bit about the equipment you're going to need, and then the final process is stacking. So this is a really, really important technique. It was pioneered by the people at the Hubble Space Telescope, um, and it's a way of combining uh, single images into one combined image by sort of adding the exposure time. So every image we take contains signal, so in this case it's the galaxy, and unwanted noise, so that, that's the thermal noise, the shot noise, everything like that, which gives us a whole the grainy image that doesn't look like it. What we do is we stack, so it averages pixel values in individual images. This means random noise is reduced and signal to noise ratio thus greatly increases. Um, in theory, um, it basically allows us to add exposure time. So for example, one five minute exposure should be the same as stacking five one minute exposure. It's not quite like that because we have shot noise and stuff to take into account as well. But it essentially means that you can take short exposures and add them together. And that allows you to do things like shoot over multiple nights. Uh, it allows you to shoot many more exposure time than like your camera would be able to track by itself. So for example, there's no way I could ever shoot a 32 hour exposure time in each in one go. But I can shoot a load of five minute exposures over several nights, stack them all together and get the final image. So this is a really, really important technique in astrophotography. Um, to be able to get um, good signal to noise ratio on your images. Um, when we're stacking, we can also calibrate our images, and this is a way to remove uh, unwanted noise and artifacts. So we have three types of calibration frame. We have dark frames, bias frames, and flat frames. Uh, anyone who's done year three OBS Astro Lab will probably uh, be having flashbacks right now. Um, dark frames are correct for fixed pattern noise and thermal noise. Um, how you take them is essentially you cover up the telescope, and you image for the same amount of time as you're doing your normal images for. That basically takes an image of just the noise of your sensor, um, particularly that fixed pattern and thermal noise. Bias corrects for shot noise, so that's the initial sort of snapping noise that you get when you take an image. And you do that by, again, covering your, set, covering your telescope, covering your camera, and taking very, very short exposure, as short as you can, um, to get that image. Then you have flat frames. Flats are to correct for vignetting and dust. So, um, if your sensor is quite large, you'll have sort of a dark ring around your image. You'll also always have dust on your sensors, on your filters, and on your telescope, um, which will appear as sort of big motes in the image that you really don't want. So flats, what you do is you point the telescope at either a patch of sort of morning sky, or you put a tracer pad or tablet over it um, to give you sort of a bright, flat source of light. You then cover it with either a white t-shirt or a white sort of... Um, Pillowcase is what I use to sort of diffuse the light, and then you take a number of exposures like that. So you can take all of these frames, 
um, and basically subtract them from your uh, images um, to reduce the amount of noise that you're going to get before you've even done any post-processing at all. Um, next thing you're going to be doing when you're processing is stretching. So this is another really crucial step. So I mentioned how we want a high dynamic range in our camera. Again, everything in space is very faint. So when we're imaging, all the detail is going to be in the very dark bit that the camera's catching, where you're only getting a few uh, photons um, per pixel. So you can see here, uh, the things in the bottom are histograms. So basically, along the left, you have the um, sort of the darkness. So all the way on the left is black, all the way on the white, right is like pure white. Um, and then the, the amplitude of the graph is how much um, you've got of that signal. So you can see here, this is a stacked image, one that I took um, only last week. Um, and you can see all the data is right down in that dark end. You can only see a couple of stars in the image. So what you do is you stretch it, you're literally stretching out the histogram. And you do this just in a program like uh, Photoshop or Pixinsight or anything like that. Stretch that histogram, uh, which brings all of that detail that's down in the dark end into the region of the photo that you can see. And that means you can go from a black photo to something like that, which has all the detail, all the stars and their velocity and whatever you're trying to get capture um, clearly visible. Then uh, the real fun begins. You have a whole load of post-processing to do. Um, this can often take as long as the actual imaging itself. Um, here's an idea of a simple work through. So you stack your image, you then crop it because you'll have sort of weird stuff around the edges. Uh, do a background extraction, do some denoise, stretch it, do more denoise. Um, and then saturation and contrast. You can do so much more than that. You can remove the stars, do stuff to them, add them back in. You can create masks around galaxies and maybe lost so you can, you can edit just those. The whole point is we're trying to bring out as much detail from the image as possible. You've got trying to go from something that looks like a faint fuzzy blob to something that has a really sort of fantastic um, structure and color and vibrancy um, that you don't get um, from just sort of the raw data. This may be sort of untruthful. It may sound like you're sort of doctoring the image. Um, it is. It is um, definitely that. Because you're making everything look much more even. So for example, the rosette there's going to be here. Um, on the right, you see it's been processed. It's looking much, much brighter. Um, it doesn't look like it like that in real life at all. Um, but that's what we're doing. We're trying to make it look more visible. Um, it all stems from the science back in sort of the 70s and 60s of trying to make it look like we've got as much uh, detail visible as possible. So you can see, oh, that's a star forming region, uh, that's a supernova structure, stuff like that. So we're trying to get as much detail in the image as possible. We're not necessarily concerned about making sure the colors and the um, sort of relative brightness of everything is actually scientifically accurate. However, there is an important caveat to that. Um, some things are accepted in the community, other things are not. So for example, it's completely fine to mess around with your colors. You can make nibbler green or blue or purple, or whatever you want, nobody seems to care. Um, what people really don't like is when you add things that aren't there. So one particular thing that's come up in the last few years is AI noise removal. So this is using a program called Topaz. Topaz is fantastic. It's a AI noise removal tool that was made for daytime photography. So if you take your photo from a bear, and it's really far away and it's all grainy, then you can apply this thing and your bear looks better. However, it's not good at space stuff. You can see here's a really good example. Um, you have that dark nebula there, so dark dust cloud is not emitting any light, and the noise removal tool has completely butchered it, added a whole load of structure that just isn't there. And that's sort of the main thing that if there's anything that's going to um, put people off your image, even if it's processed well, is adding things that aren't there, going too far with it. And there's not, it is a bit of a fine line, it is a bit of a balance to try and make sure you, you know, get as nice an image as possible without adding things that aren't realistic um, in terms of detail and structures. Um, a good example of this is there's an AI uh, tool that's trained specifically for astro images. It was trained on Hubble images and it's called Flow Exterminator. Um, and that is used by quite a lot of people. It's slightly controversial. Some people like it, some people don't. But that does a far better job because it knows what um, space images are supposed to look like. So it, most of the time it doesn't add structures which aren't there and therefore it's considered okay to use that, but it's considered not okay to use topaz because it does all the things like that. So it's a bit of a minefield um, and it's just something that people should sort of consider. 
So that's a bit about it for me waffling at you about theory. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the different rigs that I mentioned at the start, talk about what's in them and how much you might expect to pay for them. For anyone that's thinking, oh, this sounds interesting, I'm going to convince you that it's too much money and time and effort. <laughs> so the untracked setup um, is the most basic thing, a DSLR, a tripod, uh, a stock or basic camera lens, um, and an invalometer, which basically allows you to take exposures without having to run up, press the button, or run away. Um, and that is the sort of images you can get with this. So you can see, even with a very basic setup, you can get nebulae like that, you can get galaxies like that. If you know what you're doing, you can borrow a camera from somebody um, or steal it when they're not looking, and you get actually some half decent images of the night sky. The next setup from that is you're then, um, you're then adding the tracking mount. We're then adding a better lens that's better able to um, take images of things and not look awful. Um, and with that comes more money. So Star Tracker is going to cost you about £300, a better lens or a small telescope about another £300. But you see here you've got a vast improvement in the images. You're able to take longer exposure lengths, you're able to have better optics, um, and you can get much, much nicer images um, with the kit that you've got. Then there's a big jump. Um, so then you've got to have a bigger telescope, you've got to have a bigger mount, you've got to have everything that goes with it. So you're thinking more like a modded uh, camera or a one-shot colour camera, so an astro camera but that's in colour. Um, a go-to mount like this one here, a small telescope and guiding as well. And here you see there's a huge increase in what you can get with this. You're able to do much, much longer exposures, you're able to image in much, much more detail. And then you have the next tier above that. Um, where you look at premium mounts, premium telescopes, things like autofocus, which use electronic motors to focus your telescope rather than you having to do it yourself, uh, monochrome camera filters, the whole thing. Um, and this is where you get the really fantastic images. If you've ever seen you know, award-winning images or images that people sell or print for too much money, um, this is the sort of uh, equipment they use to do it. Um, normally combined with dark skies as well. So you see there's a huge range of different rigs, different prices. Um, you can go even higher than this. You can go, you can buy telescopes which are 50,000 pounds and you can buy mounts to put them on which are 100,000 um, pounds. Not many people do that, but the options there, if anyone's gonna go into finance, I think that's gonna be the, the plan for them. So if this has been interesting to you and you're thinking about doing astrophotography and you have DSLR, here's some things that you can shoot. Um, the Andromeda Galaxy, it's been in this presentation quite a lot because it's, everyone knows it, it's big and bright and it's very visible pretty much all year round. Um, it's a great target for first-time astrophotographers, um, whether you have a telescope and you're holding your phone up to it, or whether you have a camera, DSLR camera and you try and set it up to take photos of the night sky. Um, the Orion Nebula as well, it's around only in sort of the winter months. Um, it's basically at its best at the moment. It's the brightest nebula in the Northern Hemisphere, one of the brightest nebulas in the night sky as a whole. Um, and because it's so bright, you can capture it really easily with, again, just a, a DSLR on a tripod or um, just a, a camera held up to a telescope. So that's it for the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if anyone's not in the Astrosoft Discord, I'm going to plug it. There's a QR code. Scan the QR code, you'll get in our Discord. Um, when we do our uh, observing, where we have the telescopes out, I'll put a message in the SNO chat to, to let everyone know. But yeah, thank you very much for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Let me have some water first. Yes, Peter. So you mentioned modding your DSLR to remove the images from the image of the Yeah. Um, is that because you wanted to do it yourself or is it because you might have? Or is that it, it, it depends on what camera you have. So some cameras are much more difficult to mod than others, and it's something you have to look at at first. It also depends on how much you value your cameras. And it also depends on how much confidence you have in yourself. Um, I did not choose to try and mod mine, but I know many people that have. You can do it with essentially a set of screwdrivers and a couple of hours. Um, but if something goes wrong, then you lose your camera. 
Um, you can also, there's plenty of, there's companies that will mod your camera for you. It costs, depending on what camera you have, somewhere in the region of 150 to 300 pounds to do that. Hence why a lot of people do it themselves. Um, but yeah, basically, if you want to, you can. If you're, if you've got the money and you're a bit less confident, then you can pay someone else to do it for you. Does anyone else? Yes. Uh, you mentioned the staff. Do you get the same diminishing return as stacking on the ticket that you do with modern No, you don't. So a stacking. Do you not? No, you do. Yes. I sorry. I'm I'm chatting rubbish. You do get diminishing returns. It's not quite the same. Um, so you'll always be better with more data when you're stacking. Um, the thing about diminishing returns when you're taking a photo is basically you have a whole load of noise that you get at the start of your image, so that's your shot noise. And then the rest of the noise is going to be pretty even across however long you're observing for. So basically the longer you're observing, the less that initial shot noise actually matters. So that's why you get the diminishing returns there. It's less of an issue when you're stacking. So the rule of thumb is basically more more exposure isn't always better, more stacking is always better. Um, so it's much, it's much, much less of an issue. Yeah, go on. So one other thing is, you mentioned you can get the camera negative 45 degrees most of the time. Yeah. yeah. How? How do you get that remote? I don't actually know what the cooling mechanism is. Yeah. Is what? Yeah. There you go. I think yeah, it's some sort something like that. It's basically a heat exchange plate within the camera. So you have a have a heat exchange plate. You basically have a big cavity. So I don't know how well anyone can actually see, but if I do that, you can see the camera. So essentially, all the camera stuff is actually right here in the front. Then you have the heat exchanger here, and then all the rest of the big cavities are in front of that. So all that does is circulate air. Then the heat exchange cools it, and then it cools. I just press a button. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Can you see the difference in magnitude of this in the last DNN, like, on, and what that means uh, to... Say again? Okay, I'll look into it for more. Um, for really fancy, like, observatory cameras, you can get water-cooled cameras, and, like, cryogenic cameras and stuff like that. Yeah, lithium and lit Yeah. But those are like tens of thousands of pounds and nothing that you'd ever use if you're an amateur. <laughs> yeah, go on, Rodri. Um, I'm in school and it's upside down on my on the net. Can you use it on multiple machines? I think so. Okay, I'll find something. Why, do you want to steal my license? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, go on. Uh, what are the best softwares? For, uh, what best software? What software would you recommend to use for controlling your camera for certain images? Okay, well, there's many schools of thought on this. I believe my one is the right one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in terms of controlling cameras, there's so my fantastically lovely red camera is made by a company called ZWO, who are basically the biggest camera manufacturer. And they would like to convince you that their system is the best system. And you can get the uh, the con controller, which is called an asset, no, ASI Air, not ASA, um, which you then interface with that, and that lets you control all your cameras and stuff. Um, I personally use an open source software called NINA, um, which is stands for Nighttime Imaging in Astronomy, um, which is what's up on the laptop, and I'll demonstrate that in a second. Uh, that lets you control any camera from any any uh, manufacturer that lets you control basically any filter wheel, basically any mount. Um, I wanted to get it working with the university observatory, but they told me no, but it would, it would do it. Um, but that's what I use to, to, to control camera stuff. In terms of processing, um, you can use Photoshop. It's not ideal. Um, it's pretty good because it has so much functionality. Um, but there are dedicated astrophotography processing softwares um, like uh, Cyril is one, which is free, or there's PixInsight, which is a sort of the best one out there. It's got a whole load of functionality, but it is paid. Um, so there's loads of different stuff out there. You can do a whole load of research and come up with a whole load of different answers, but that's what I think. Open source software to guide, 
picks and site to stack and do uh, all your processing. Uh, anyone got any other questions? Yeah, go on. Processing rate. Yeah. When you're restacking, is it better to stack it as a JPEG first or after edit or stack it as a row? Okay, never use JPEGs. Um, if you use JPEG, it won't work. If you're doing uh, doing it with DSLR, you always need to use raw because um, basically the compression of JPEG kills all of that data. Um, if I there you go. Basically, JPEG, JPEG compression kills a whole load of the data right down here, um, and it means that you just get horrible artifacts in your image, and it doesn't look nice at all. So if you're doing it with a DSLR camera, you should always shoot in RAW, always stack in RAW, always process in um, TIFF or FITS, which is like lossless file compression. Um, and you only you only want to compress it at the very, very end when you've got your final image and you're trying to show all your friends and post it to Instagram and stuff. Cool, any other questions? No, all right. Um, so that's the end of the presentation format. Um, obviously, we can't go to the roof now. So <laughs> basically, it's up to you what to do. If you want to head home, you're going to head home. Um, I'm going to stick around. If you want to come and ask questions, ask questions. I will demonstrate the telescope as well, show you how you can control it from a laptop if you want to come and see that. But yeah, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for listening, and hope you have a good evening. <laughs>